Good morning, and thank you, Mary. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Are we work? Are we? Is that working? Yes. Okay. She's tall. Lean in. I'm going to lean <laughs> in. <laughs> That's never been an issue for me. Uh, so it's so um, great to be here for this very important event. Um, this panel will focus on advancing healthcare equity in the digital age. And first, we're going to hear from Dr. Molly Coy. Molly's the executive in residence at Avia, and sh um, she's going to provide an overview on the topic. Then we're going to hear from Dr. Kenya Beard, the Dean of Nursing and Health Sciences at Nassau Community College, and she's going to describe the opportunities and challenges related to technology and equity. And last, uh, third, Molly McCarthy, the Chief Nursing Officer at Microsoft, will share information on the nurse's role in technology. All right, so I'm going to have uh, you begin. Dr. Coy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is really impressive and wonderful. And I'm going to come at you fairly fast because we each have a set amount of time. And we're all going to be disciplined, and so I'm going to be looking for the high sign when I'm getting too close. Um, and what I want to do is expose you to not just a future possibility, but something that is happening now in the field that I hope you will take seriously as one. No. Oh. Okay, um, I don't think, maybe if I just use one of the microphones, thank you. Hoist on the petard of technology. Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. Or am I doing that? Okay, I'll do it. Thank you. Uh, so, the purpose of this presentation is to acquaint the committee and the audience here with emerging patterns of digitally enabled care that will profoundly change the responsibilities of nurses and other clinicians. I'm beginning with a general description of the functions that are changing, and then I'm going to give three examples of early stage services driven by AI that are significantly having an impact in the market, meaning that people are starting to use them in large numbers. So this is not just something that might happen someday. This is something that's actually out there. To do that, I'm giving examples of three concrete products that are being used on the market. And please understand, when you talk about the future and you show something like this, this is not to recommend that product. It's not to say that even that product will be the winner. Three to five years from now, it may be an entirely different company and the product may look quite different. The reason I'm doing it this way is so that you understand that consumers, patients, and clinicians are starting to use it in big numbers. So I want to end with the implications for the future of nurses. So let me start with the sort of overall summary, you sort of tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them afterwards what you just said. Five years from now, I am arguing market traction, meaning adoption and use, is likely to confirm the consumer preference and clinical resource efficiency of applications of digital technologies such as telehealth, which by now is much more accepted. I think many of you would say, well, that doesn't surprise me and artificial intelligence. And I want to acknowledge that there are a multitude of unresolved questions which leadership organizations are starting to address, but which are very, very important in terms of bias, equity, et cetera. So in planning for the well-being and the effectiveness and fulfillment of clinical professions, nursing or any other, early evidence for the potentially profound disruptions of their roles and responsibilities should be considered and these changes will require the further preparation of nursing leadership to participate and lead the associated transformation of health services. Now, I want to suggest, because this is hosted by a school of nursing, that this is not just about preparing new nurses who will come out four or five or six years from now. This is about having executive education courses 
so that we have squadrons of nurses out there who have a deep understanding of this and are ready to lead and to exert their own wisdom and personal sense of what's important. That's what we need. So here's the first example. This is virtual triage. And there are quite a number. There are seven or eight companies out on the scene right now. These use artificial intelligence to do a symptom checker, like you'd think of, you go on the Mayo site or the WebMD site. But this speaks back to you. It's, it's interactive using a chatbot and takes you to a presumptive diagnosis and based on that, and of course it's not an actual diagnosis because of F, FDA regs, but it actually competes very well with Harvard primary care physicians 90 to 95 percent accurate in comparison with them in triage and diagnosis. And I'm going to make these slides available so I won't go through all of the detail. But over on the right you'll see one of these which is giant and it's got a sense of humor. So I would suggest to you buoy, giant, medic door, um, Babylon, Go on, you, it doesn't cost anything, try them out. And remember Clayton Christensen, the father of innovation in healthcare, who always said that disruptive innovations are largely ignored by the dominant mainstream providers, that they are more convenient for the consumer, they are cheaper for the consumer, these don't cost anything for the consumer, and they are good enough. So they don't have all the bells and whistles, but they're good enough. So here's what happened in the first um, 15 months of buoy, which came out of Harvard Medical Informatics. They got to 40 million users. That was 23 million unique users in the United States in, 12, in 13, what are the 15 months. So that's what I mean by adoption. You know, while most Providers in the United States have no idea. We made a map. I work with a network of 44 health systems, that's what Avia is, to actually try to figure out what digital technologies health systems might want to adopt. We made a map of the market centers of 15 of our 44 members, gave it to Bowie, and they told us how many millions of people in their market area had used it in the last 15 months. For most of our members, it was like one to two million people in their market area. They had no idea. So this is, I think, a significant, how can you lead an industry when you don't know what's going on? So over on the right, you'll see I used to be on the board of Aetna. You can read my bio. I'm not going through all the disclaimers and everything. But um, Aetna and CVS merged. But before even that they had merged, CVS had done a deal with Bowie so that anybody who goes on the CVS site for Minute Clinic can go through the virtual triage. And the result of that, everybody said, oh, this is because they want to drive more foot traffic to their pharmacy and their retail. Not at all. 31% of the people who come onto the buoy site are referred back for watchful waiting. And for each level of care, if they had intended to go to the ED, as a result, they're more likely to go for urgent care. If they had intended to go for urgent care, they're more likely to wind up going for a primary care appointment. So it shifts volume in a very big way. So health plans now are snapping up the opportunity to invest in them and to um, use their products. So, and I, I thought that I had my, usually I always have a disclaimer you know, a disclosure slide in the very beginning, and I'll make sure it's in it when it's distributed. But I'm no longer on the Aetna board, and I do have a relationship with the next company that I'm going to show you. But it's the only one out there doing exactly what they're doing, so I'm showing it to you anyway, but I wanted to make sure that, you know, I'm just an advisor. But um, So th this is the one, and this one is called 98.6, which is sort of too cute. <laughs> but, um, Anyway, what this is is text-based primary care. 
So let's say that the virtual triage says you should go to your primary care physician. Well, you can just switch over to this app. You can enroll as an individual consumer, direct to consumer, for 20 bucks for the year. Employers pay $1 per employee per month for all the primary care through this system that they can eat 24-7, 365 days a year. So that's a part of what's starting to shift in the market. And a chatbot is the intake assistant gathering the history and any pictures that they've sent, if it's germ or something like that. And then a live physician comes on and is introduced in chats with the patient. 95% of the presenting conditions that are truly primary care, that don't need to go to emergency room right away, for example, can be resolved without a physical visit. They now have, in the end of the first year, 100,000 people covered. And they have higher net promoter scores, higher satisfaction from their patients than Kaiser, primary care groups, and many other, like Netflix and Amazon. Because it's convenient, it's cheap, and it's good enough. And they can send patients for labs. They have deals with LabQuest and, or Quest and LabCorp. Um, but, and then get the labs back and have another chat. But it's pretty, <laughs> frankly, amazing. <laughs> oh, here are the, um, some of the statistics. So they have their own salaried physicians. So why aren't there nurse practitioners in there, right? Why aren't nurse practitioners starting companies like this? The, and they've licensed them. Um, actually, by now, they're licensed in every state in the country, each one of those clinicians. And um, they've treated over 200 different conditions. About 25% of the visits are returning users. So you can see, it's cheap, and it's got high adoption. This is another one that's fascinating to me. This is using behavioral economics. Now, you know that, and this is one of the bitter truths about the evolution of health systems today, is that nurses have essentially been squeezed out of primary care. That's not necessarily true everywhere, but by and large, most nurses are in the hospital or in outpatient procedures and clinics of that type. And ambulatory, you might have nurse practitioners substituting for a clinician, uh, for a physician, but you're not seeing nurse staffing as we used to have. Now, maybe that's the right thing, maybe that's the wrong thing, but the result is nurses aren't really present much in this world of population health that is changing so fast. And so, again, I urge those of you involved in academic preparation to focus, have some resources focused on this, doing research on it, and also training nurse executives. So what this is, you know that one of the jobs that still sometimes is, remains for nurses in ambulatory is behavioral coaching. In or, you know, given a high cost, high need population, and trying to get them to change their behavior, uh, take their meds, for example. So this was developed for dual population, mostly women, so Medicare and Medicaid, poor, multilingual, and they started with diabetics where the adherence to medications was about 35%. And in 90 days, they got the adherence over 80%. And what they did is they asked them if they had smartphones. 50% of them had smartphones. If they didn't, they loaned them smartphones. And every day they said, we're putting $2 in a bank account for you. If you take a picture of the meds you're going to take in your hand before you take them. And the, it's all behavioral economics research about the intent when you actually get it in your hand <laughs> is worth more than all the promises you ever made to somebody. And so it has this huge effect. 
And the company thought at the end of three months, well, you've got where you want to be and that their customers, the health plans again, were going to say, okay, drop the patients now. But the plan said, no, we'll keep going all year long because the reduction in emergency room visits and hospitalizations is so great. The entire service for a year costs less than one emergency room visit for one of these patients. And so that's now being applied. And you can see down here post-discharge AMI, high risk across the board, Medicaid diabetes, heart failure in Medicaid, um, coordinated behavioral health. And it's being used in a whole bunch of different areas. And I hope, as our next speakers are going to be talking about equity in diverse populations, that it doesn't fail to be noticed that this was developed first in and is being continued to spread within Medicaid in very diverse populations with very high satisfaction scores from the patients and their families. So this is the sort of final point here. This is why I say we have to pay attention because the market traction is happening now. It's not like an FA FDA approval process where we're safe for 10 years because it's going to take that long to get permission. And so this rapid leveraging of clinicians means that the resource needs are going to be different. Clinical roles will evolve to consultation and these various kinds of roles that I list here. And so the struggles are really ones where the leadership, and that's why I think the NAM committee is so important, needs to say, you know, it's like the Paul Revere ringing the bell. There is something going on out there that we need to not just be a part of, but seizing leadership. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now we will hear from Kenya Beard.